Okay, so now we've made the diagnosis, how do we treat these things? And again, I'm gonna come back for just a second about to arterial clots and talk about that um, just to show the differences. So again, risk factor modification, prevent vascular disease, and you're gonna prevent a lot of arterial thrombotic events. So don't smoke, don't be Homer Simpson, control your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, treat your diabetes. You can't really change your family history. Um, you can not talk to those people, but you know, after you get the information about the venous thrombosis, then, then you can ignore them. Um, but there's lots of things we can do to reduce the risk of vascular disease, and all that is very effective at helping to prevent arterial clots. Antiplatelet medications, as I mentioned before, aspirin is the classic one. There are some others that we sometimes use. Help keep the platelets from being overly sticky. This is also very important, but this does not really help prevent venous clots. So what do we do there? Again, it's all about prophylaxis. So prophylaxis at times of increased risk, recognizing those acquired triggers when they come into the mix, and then doing something about it. Um, we talked about mechanical prophylaxis. Here's a list of medications we use uh, for initial short-term prophylaxis and sometimes treatment. If you develop a clot, we put you on some type of a blood thinner. Uh, initially, these are all IV or subcutaneous. And then for long-term management, we have an oral blood thinner uh, warfarin. So in summary, the treatment of these things really starts with preventing them. It's a heck of a lot easier to prevent a clot than it is to treat a clot once you've got it. So if we do our job right, we shouldn't have to treat so many of these things. It's important to keep straight that venous and arterial clots are different. The preventative strategies are different. The treatments are different. Um, these drugs commonly are, are, are misthought of as being clot dissolvers, and they don't dissolve clots. These clots help tip that balance back towards your body's natural clot dissolving system. Um, these treatment decisions that we make are very complicated. You have to sit down with people individually. You have to really think carefully about how long to be on blood thinners, and it's a whole complicated discussion. It goes beyond what we have time for today. But it's important that you sit down and talk with your doctor about that and that we reevaluate this periodically to make sure we're still doing the right thing. The recommendations have changed quite a bit over the years. They continue to be modified as we get smarter, more research, more understanding. So just some final thoughts. Um, this is a really big problem. I don't have to say that by now. Everybody understands venous thromboembolism is a significant public health problem, and that's why we're all here. That's why the CDC is here. Um, these can be prevented. Take home point number two. You can prevent these things if you know about them. And then we have to continue to work hard to increase awareness, and you guys are a huge part of that, and we thank you for your support. Does warfarin protect against arterial clots? Aspen works to prevent arterial clots, not venous clots. Does warfarin, which works well against venous clots, help protect against arterial clots? The answer is sort of. Um, so aspirin is basically no protection against venous thrombosis. Warfarin gives you some protection against arterial thrombosis, but it's not nearly as good as aspirin is not nearly as good as preventing venous clots. So we sometimes do use warfarin in people who've had recurrent stroke, for example, um, but, but I like to tend to think of them as separate issues. So there is some overlap, but by and large, aspirin arterial warfarin venous is how I think about it. How common is it to have both arterial and venous thrombosis? There are a few conditions in which you have a tendency to form both arterial and venous clots. Um, by and large, you know, the way I presented this here, it's a separate issue, but there are a few things that do increase your risk for both. There's a thing called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome in which we see both arterial and venous clots. There are some blood and bone marrow diseases that put you at risk for both arterial and venous clots. Um, but aside from those few examples, by and large, we should think of these as separate things. The genetic risk factors, factor V Leiden and prothrombogy mutation and so forth, those are far and away stronger risk factors for venous clots. They're not really risk factors for arterial clots. So we tried to think about these separately, although there are a few situations where we can see both. Are there any new oral blood thinners coming? Yeah, there actually, um, there's one drug right now that's probably, it's very close to being approved. It's before the FDA. Um, there are actually probably five or six in development. So there are several new oral blood thinners coming down the pipeline. Um, the advantage that they're gonna have over warfarin is that they won't require the monitoring. So anybody who's on warfarin or, or knows somebody on it, you know, you have to get your INR checked periodically to make sure you're, you're not too thin or too thick. Um, these new drugs are, are gonna be better in that they won't require the monitoring. They won't hopefully have as many interactions with other medications. Um, they're still gonna have a bleeding risk. I mean, any blood thinner is gonna have a risk of bleeding. Um, you know, warfarin's been around for about 60 years. Um, it's the only oral blood thinner we've had for a very, very long time. So we know a lot about it. It, it. Yes, it's a difficult medicine to be on because of all the interactions and the monitoring. But, you know, if it's used properly and people are monitored appropriately, it's really quite safe. So these new drugs, um, you know, it's, it's a tough act to beat. Um, they may be better in terms of less need for monitoring, less interactions with other drugs, but they've gotta be as safe as warfarin and they can't have other side effects. That's the other problem with these new drugs. There was one actually that was uh, on the market in Europe for about a year. 
um, came before the FDA three, maybe four years ago now. We all thought it was going to get approved, and it turns out that it had a couple of side effects that warfarin doesn't have, and so it didn't get approved. Um, so, you know, we know these drugs are coming. I think the thing to look out for, though, is when they, when they finally do come, when, when one of these gets approved, you know, who are we going to use these drugs in? I think they're probably going to be used initially in people that have a short-term need for a blood thinner. Um, you know, any drug that's new, we don't know what happens after 10 or 20 or 30 years of being on it. We know what it looks like with warfarin because it's been around 60 years. So the long-term safety, the long-term use of these newer drugs is probably something that we're going to have to learn over time. So I don't think warfarin is going away anytime soon. Um, it's going to be around. There, there will be other choices to think about, but I think warfarin is going to be here for the foreseeable future, uh, for, at least for our chronic anticoagulation patients. What does the D-dimer test indicate, and how helpful is it? If it's negative, it's really accurate. So a negative D-dimer is really, really reassuring that you haven't had a recent clotting event. If it's positive or elevated, it could be a clot or a bazillion other things. Well, half a bazillion, but a lot of other things. So it's, it's helpful if it's negative. If it's positive, it doesn't mean you've had a clot. It means we've got to look harder. 